Professor Trent Keniston, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. How about yourself? I'm doing very well. Thanks so much for agreeing to do this. This has been a long time coming. I have a lot of great questions to ask you, and I can't wait to hear uh, what you have to say. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure. Um, you've been uh, such a profound influence on uh, on my playing, on my teaching, um, on the kind of person that I'm trying to be, um, all of that. And I, uh, I, uh, I want to thank you for, you know, uh, your patience, uh, with me and, uh, uh, for, uh, just all your insight. You never hit anything. You were always uh, very generous. Well, uh, very kind of you. And, and I'll also obviously appreciate it, but uh, it's always a pleasure to work with you and watch you grow. And uh, there was so much talent there to begin with. I just tried to stay out of the way. <laughs> well, well, why don't you why don't you tell uh, uh, tell our audience uh, tell us about yourself, uh, tell us where you're from and where you grew up and what your childhood was like and and all of that. Uh, well, I was um, born and raised in Tucson, Arizona, where I am now, and um, um, went to school uh, here uh, all the way uh, through the University of Arizona, where I graduated uh, with degrees in music education, and uh, I was told I got the first performance, classical performance degree in saxophone there. Um, and that was with the saxophone teacher. So, um, and I taught public schools um, in Southern California for three years and back here in Tucson for two years. I did high school band and orchestra for a couple of years. And then I went to junior high and elementary beginning band. Um, and after five years of uh, public school teaching, I got the job at Western Michigan University and was there for 39 years and retired um, in 2012. So I've been retired now for almost eight years. All right. Um, why did you decide to become a musician? Um, I think uh, it was um, just a variety of situations and happenstance. I. Um, they had a thriving music education program in the Tucson public schools in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, I'm not familiar with it now, um, but um, at that time it was really thriving. I remember starting out by ha having a flutophone class in the fourth grade, maybe beginning of the fifth grade. Um, it's a long time ago, you know. <laughs> and. Uh, and after that, I wanted to play clarinet, but I was missing my front teeth. And so um, my mother said, why don't you play violin and pull the violin out of the closet? And at the time, I never thought much about it. I thought, oh, okay. So I started my first, maybe the second semester, the first semester was the, this flutophone thing, uh, playing violin. And then over the the remainder of that year in the summer, I, I got my teeth back, grew back in, and I wanted to play in band, and uh, they pulled out a clarinet. And I have no idea, I mean, I just learned shortly before mother passed away in 1999 that she was concert master or mistress of her high school orchestra. And I, and I never, she never told me once that she played music or that she had any kind of music background. And so that made sense to, you know, where that violin came from when she just pulled it out of the closet. Um, and so they also had a clarinet and I have no idea where it came from, but it was the King Cleveland metal clarinet. And pretty much nothing on the right hand worked. And so I started out um, in fifth grade band and sixth grade band playing this old clarinet that um, squeaked and squawked more than, you know, it 
played any kind of tone. Uh, when I got to junior high school, uh, the band director there wasn't having it, and he put me on bass clarinet. And that kind of started my love of playing bass clarinet. And then in the eighth grade, he asked if I wanted to play tenor saxophone. And I said, you know, of course. And so I got a tenor saxophone. And when I got to high school, uh, they didn't need any more saxophones. Uh, so I ended up being like fourth or fifth chair bass clarinet in the band. And uh, that pretty much told you about my skill level at the time. Um, but um, the end, halfway through my first year, I think my freshman year, maybe my sophomore year, the band director said uh, they had a high school jazz band that was kind of theory class and jazz ensemble. So it was a college prep theory class and it was a jazz ensemble. And he said, we need a tenor saxophone for the jazz ensemble. And he's looking at the saxophone section and the whole section is kind of lowering their heads and looking at their feet. And I'm back in the back of the clarinet saying section, you know, raising my hand and saying, oh, I can do it. I play tenor. I played tenor in junior high school. I'd love to do it. And finally, after um, the um, uh, director didn't get any response from any of the saxophone players, he looked at me and said, OK, Keniston, but you better step up. And so I started playing tenor in the, um, in the, in the jazz band. Uh, we played dances after almost every football game. We played for the senior prom, if you can imagine. The high school dance band, jazz band, played for the senior prom. And we got paid for it. And so this was, you know, kind of a big deal. And I got excited about it. You know, I bought a Cannonball Adderley record, and Cannonball led me to Miles, and Miles led me to Train. And that side of it kind of took off. Um, and I went from last chair bass clarinet to, you know, getting first chair all city and all state band my junior year on tenor and first chair all city and all state on alto my senior year. And so the transformation over about, you know, 12, 15 months um, was uh, pretty significant, I guess. And then um, another uh, important thing uh, happened, and that is my high school band director was friends with Fred Hemke and taught with him during the summer up at a music camp in Gunnison, Colorado. And he invited Hemke to come and be a soloist with our band. And um, so he was playing the Boats of Concertino, a couple movements of it that John Painter had arranged for concert band, uh, and also the uh, Warren Benson uh, concertino. So I got copies of the solo parts and I learned them and I rehearsed them with the band. And then uh, Hemke came and was a soloist with the band and then we went on tour. We played a bunch of high schools around southern Arizona for the better part of a week and I got to sit with him on the bus every day and just talk to him. And he was uh, larger than life and very inspiring and that kind of uh, uh, set me on a goal towards playing classical saxophone. Hmm. And, uh, and that led to my degree in performance and my uh, eventual kind of career path because I was hired as a sa classical saxophone teacher. And my jazz performing was always fun, always, you know, to make money on the weekends and to have a good time, but it was never the real focal point. And uh, so that's basically, you know, kind of the, my early days and directions. Yeah. And uh, so what projects have you worked on and uh, bands that you've played in and uh, which were your favorite and, and why? Well, you mean in terms of classical and or jazz or just anything? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I actually, why don't you do classical and jazz? Well, um, I, in, in the classical field, I mean, really my, uh, my pride and joy and, and most uh, important, I think, uh, contributions come as a teacher. Um, and I feel very strongly about that now as a performer, I've had the chance to play with uh, some noted orchestras and bands. And for a while, when I was recruiting students to Western Michigan University, I would go around and play concertos with high school bands all over the Midwest and, you know, try to get uh, the better students to come to the school and things like that. 
Um, and I made a number of record albums, uh, long play records back in those days. Um, and then some, um, some CDs. And uh, I had the opportunity of uh, commissioning uh, the uh, Robert Mijinsky Sonata for Saxophone and Piano that was written for me in 1970. And I premiered that at the World Saxophone Congress in December in Chicago of that year. Uh, and that piece has gone on to be a real staple and, and a, a, an important piece and fun piece for literally thousands and thousands of saxophone players. And it's been recorded many, many times now. Uh, I then later commissioned uh, Bob Nijinsky, who was on the music faculty here at the University of Arizona. So I knew him when I was a student there. And, um, and then asked him to do this when I was actually back here teaching junior high band. Um, and then a few years later, when I was at Western, I uh, commissioned him to write a concerto for the saxophone and chamber orchestra. And we premiered that in Kalamazoo. It was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize that year. And then, because it's difficult for saxophonists to find really high quality chamber orchestras to perform with, um, I arranged it for wind ensemble and uh, recorded it and have played it many, many times with uh, college wind ensembles. And now that piece has been recorded uh, numerous times as well. And there have been other pieces that have been written for me on the classical side that you know, have been a challenge. And, um, and you know, that association has been really a lot of fun. Yeah, those, those, uh, those two pieces, the concerto and the sonata, um... I love those pieces. Um, of course, I've played both of them. Um, most recently, I played the Sonata. I think when I was studying with you, I played the Concerto. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, those are both beautiful pieces of music. And um, I'm, I, I, uh, I wish more people uh, dug into the Concerto. You know, um, the Sonata, I mean, everybody plays that. And, you know, that's, I mean, you have to. If you're if you're doing a classical saxophone degree, you're going to have to play that. that uh, well, the concerto initially, when Nijinsky wrote it, he had a kind of a pencil score, uh, a piano score, and he mm -hmm. actually orchestrated it from you know he actually wrote it out for piano. But when they published it and they published his hand manuscript of it, it's he said specifically, this is not intended for performance with piano. And so uh, when I did the uh, wind ensemble version of the piece and I sent it to him and I sent him a recording of it, he said, you know, I'm not certain that I don't like the wind ensemble version better because there's so many more colors. And when I did it, I reduced the, uh, on finale, reduced the part down to a piano part. I had pianists at the university that worked with play it for me and give me some advice in terms of this is bad, this is awkward, don't do like this or do it like this and go over it with me to edit it. And then I sent it to the publisher, Theodore Presser, and um, they said, uh, we'll publish it, but we have to sell out of what we've already printed. And so as soon as they finished you know, selling all the original uh, pressing or, or uh, edition, of uh, Musinski's manuscript uh, of the uh, reduced score of the piano part, then they republished it. And the uh, solo part in the original publication was my handwritten solo part. And uh, then when we redid it, I did a, an actual, you know, computer part in finale, and they published that as well. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, your transcribing? Well, uh, I remember I said that really my, my kind of center of my whole career, although I've done a lot of playing and I've been lucky that way, is really that of a teacher. And almost everything that I've done, I've published dozens and dozens of pieces, um, transcriptions, some original works, uh, like Bach, Bach cello suite transcriptions and mm -hmm and uh, Bach sonatas, flute sonatas, and, and uh, on and on, Vivaldi uh, oboe concertos and things like that for saxophone and edit them for saxophone. And I've done lots of jazz solo transcriptions, but almost all of those were things that I did or at least started to do for students. 
And um, so the transcription, I think one time I, I was doing a music camp in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I think I had done a transcription of either Phil Woods or Richie Cole. I can't remember. It may have been Richie Cole's solo on, uh, on one of those uh, more pop uh, vocal things, uh, Singers Unlimited or, no, it wasn't Singers Unlimited, New York Voices or, uh, you know, uh, that Richie Cole worked with. Um, and um, one of the guys there said, well, you know, you should send it this into Downbeat Magazine. They would, they would love this. So I said, okay. So I did a little analysis of it, sent it to Downbeat, and they published it and sent me a nice check and then started asking me, do you have transcription of this? Do you have transcription of this? Do you know, any, anything from, uh, from Stan Getz or Michael Brecker to uh, Kenny G uh, to, um, um, to Wenton Marcellus to uh, almost uh, every instrument. I even did um, uh, uh, Nels Arsted Pedersen bass solo, you know, that they published. At any rate, um, these I started to collect all of these and then use them with my students. And uh, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll start my own publishing company and I'll start putting these together. So I put a book of alto blues solos, tenor blues solos, tenor rhythm changes solos together and published them myself and um, ran that for probably 20, 25 years and then just closed it down. And I kind of give them away now. I have. Um, ebooks or PDFs of all of them now because they're the uh, printed copies are all gone but I post them online and send them to people if they're interested in it uh, but those have all been done just as a, basically uh, initially to give me um, more jazz kind of experience and um, uh, my learning so that then I could use that um, when I'm dealing with students I was primarily classical saxophone, maybe 75% jazz, 25%. And I went to France and studied with Jean-Marie Dex in, in Bordeaux for a year and came back probably the cl strongest classical player I've been. And that year I got invited to join a group that ultimately became the Western Jazz Quartet. And suddenly there were, we were performing all the time. We were doing a lot of weddings and parties, but we were also playing in clubs, jazz clubs. And I could no longer get by with playing my half a chorus of kind of Stan Getz imitation on Misty or something, you know. And so uh, uh, I, all of the inscriptions were just ways for me to kind of develop and learn myself and keep ahead of my students. And suddenly my uh, performance outlet became like 75, 80% jazz and 20% classical since probably the mid 80s, I would say. Yeah. Um, so uh, so t I want to dig in a little bit. Um, something that uh, maybe kind of a trivia, a little bit of trivia. Um, the plus symbol. Yes. The plus symbol above notes that are played with a harmonic fingering. Right. Um, uh, it, it seems to me that that's that's because of you. Well, maybe uh, I at first I started putting the you know a harmonic a little circle above them, and mm -hmm. I don't know if I saw somebody else use the plus sign or not. I I, I probably did. Uh, I don't remember quote inventing it, mm -hmm. but um, it seemed to be the easiest way to you know to indicate that. And then oftentimes, at least initially, when people were saying, "Well, what does that mean? What is that?" Um, I would put something in the ledger that was, you know, should we play a low, um, a low D fingering, uh, you know, to get a, a harmonic uh, A or different fingerings that you would overblow the fifth or the octave uh, from a low fingering to get the upper, uh, the upper harmonic. Uh, but after a while, I even stopped doing that because most everybody, you know, was understanding what that meant at that point. A couple yeah. of times when I did Michael Brecker solos and he would, you know, play a fundamental and then start to stack notes on top of that fundamental, I would actually write them as harmonics because it seemed that to, to be the most uh, clarified, you know, way, um, right. make it as clear as possible as to what he was doing and how he was doing it. Yeah, I mean, um, of course, you, you taught me the that whole 
the false fingering thing, the harmonic series and using that. And uh, I developed some exercises, things all based on things that you showed me. Um, but when I'm looking at transcriptions and I see a lot of transcriptions and I'm assigning my students transcriptions all the time, things that have already been written out usually to get them started with a particular artist and then I'll give them an assignment. Uh, to transcribe something because usually it's a little easier to transcribe someone um, that you've seen a transcription of so, you know it helps you to kind of get in the mindset but it's hard for me to find uh, uh, um, you know I, I it's hard to find anything with that symbol as early as you were using it yeah, maybe. you know um, so in my mind at least I, I think that's that's a uh, uh, credited to you and even if maybe someone else used it once or twice uh, certainly the convention I think was shaped because you were using it all the time and yeah. then I think that really started to shape the way that um, well I, I was also transcribing artists you know I was trying to learn what they were doing harmonically trying mm -hmm. to uh, be able to do what they were doing technically mm -hmm. and to understand it so that then I could pass it on and um, so when you start, um, you know, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, uh, Train was certainly doing some of this, but it wasn't, it wasn't a lot of it. And right. it may have been as, as much kind of accidental, but then players began to pick up on that and develop it as a, a unique part of their style. Right. And at that point, then you had to identify it and, uh, you know, find a way to notate it so that people would understand. Uh, I remember... Uh... So the when I met you, uh, our first meeting was, uh, let's see here, I must have been... Let's see if yours is the same as I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was eighth grade, um, and I had been selected for an all-state band. Um, uh, and actually, John Wojciechowski was actually in that band also. And um, uh, we... We met at Western Michigan University. Uh, uh, we the the band rehearsed there, and we were staying in the dorms and stuff. And I actually roomed with John, um, and uh, that was the first time we met, um, at least uh, that I remember. Yeah, well, I, I think it's a similar thing. I was thinking it was a youth arts festival that you were attending, as you know, as invited for something. I can't remember what. And uh, because we were, uh, I, had, I put together a quartet, and it may have been of uh, some students. I don't think it was all faculty. And we played for some kind of social or reception for all of these kids and teachers and people were involved in the youth arts festival. Mm -hmm. Or it may have been the Allstate in one of the dorms, in one cafeteria or reception room in one of the dorms. And uh, I remember coming up talking and maybe in even with the group I'm, I'm, I'm you know again it, it was a while back <laughs> yeah, it was a while ago uh but uh yeah i think it was msboa all state okay um and uh i got a lesson with you okay um and you showed me you showed me a fingering that would allow uh you to play um uh the, like a, a kind of a yodeling sort of effect on the instrument, oh, okay. which was uh, one, two, one, two, three, and the E flat key. Right. Yeah, that's the kind of Sonny Stitt uh, um, trill, B flat to G. Right, right, right. <laughs> and uh, I remember, because uh, on my first recording that came out when I was 14, I did that all over the place <laughs> on the recording because I was. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because that same fingering, if you don't use the octa, you get a multiphonic from right. low A, high B flat, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And then if you use the octave key and you kind of uh, loosen and firm up your embouchure a little bit, you can actually trill back and forth between G and B flat. And well, that's the thing that one of the things I remember about you. Um, the most is that every time I would introduce something new in a lesson to you, you get so excited about it 
And then the following week you would come back and you'd be playing it and everything and you'd written two or three tunes using it. And, uh, <laughs> and, and then I, I remember when I showed you a whole series of multiphonics. Mm. And then uh, you came back and you had a tune that was really a rather soulful, almost gospel feeling tune that had all these subtle multiphonics in it that at first sounded like really out of place and suddenly like, you know what, it makes it. And it was on. It was on your next CD, I think. Yes, that's that's right. I don't remember the name of it. But... Uh, I'm trying to think of it. Uh, uh, um, uh, I, yeah, I, of course I know what you're talking about. I can't. I can't call the name of it right now. I mean, I can in my head. I can see the pencil written fingerings underneath of the you know the notes. Um, uh, well, there's but, a funny yeah. story about those too because I went through a, a whole book. When I played, premiered the uh, Mijinsky Sonata at the World Saxophone Congress, um, one of the uh, performers there, uh, Lad McIntosh, maybe, um, I'm trying to remember, at any rate, played a piece that used multiphonics. And it's the first time I heard them. So this would have been 1970. And, uh, you know, that wasn't an accident and a mistake. And so, uh, um, uh, he put out a whole book of them and I went through this whole book and it was rather tedious and I wrote down 15 or 20 that were really interesting and I categorized them as being really loud and aggressive or very soft and subtle and there were some that were actually chords and others that were really dissonant and, and textural and so I gave these to Curtis Curtis Smith uh, at mm -hmm. the university and he wrote a piece for me that I was I premiered at a world saxophone another world saxophone congress called Unisonics, and he wrote the whole piece uh, based on these multiphonics, and they were all unison things with the piano, and he had all kinds of things inside the piano bows and plucks and bottles that he you know created different sounds with, and uh, when he got it done, he brought it up to me, and I said, "Oh, these are saxophone pitches; they're not concert pitches." <laughs> And so he had to go back and rework the whole piece. Oh man! On unisons and different textures and all these different sounds with all these different um, production effects that he got inside, you know, going inside the piano. Um, but that's where all of those you know, multiphonics originally came from, for me. Um, so, talk to us a little bit about uh, you. There's a book that is also. Um, what is it? Daily studies, mm -hmm. uh, uh, daily, daily, uh, daily, daily, all saxophones, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so can, can you, can you, so how did that come about in? Well, I, I took my first sabbatical from, uh, Western in 79 and 80 and I went to France for the year to Bordeaux to study with Jean-Marie Landex at the conservatory. My whole family went, my wife, I had three kids at the time. They were like first, third, and fifth graders. So they went over there and they got thrown into French schools. Didn't speak any French, you know, until about three months later when they were very fluent and I was still struggling. And uh, I, in studying there, uh, they required that, um, you play all your major and harmonic minor scales. They considered the melodic minor scale an American scale. And they said, so we had to play all of our uh, major scales and harmonic minor scales in consecutives, full range, in thirds and in fourths. And then we went on to whole tone and diminished scales, the same thing. And so I did all of this and uh, in order for me to, again to use it with my own students, I wrote it down. And uh, I did a lot of professional copying at that time. So I, I wrote this book all by hand and I wrote all these scales out. And then I did a whole bunch of tuning exercises and uh, articulation exercises that went along with it. And uh, when I got back, I had just planned to disseminate all of this stuff to my students and require that they you know, throughout their eight semesters or seven semesters that they were with me, that they had certain requirements 
in order for certain grades in order to uh, uh, complete mastery of these scale patterns that prescribe tempos and articulations and all this kind of stuff. And so <clears throat> when I got back, I decided to send it to a publisher that was interested in my jazz solo transcription books as well. And uh, this was a little company in Lebanon, Indiana called uh, Studio PR. And later Studio PR was bought out by Columbia Pictures Bellwin, CPP Bellwin. And they then took that over. And so um, that has been out since probably 1980-ish, 81-ish, um, and still sells just hundreds and hundreds of books a year, which for a book like that is a lot over a period of 40 years, you know, 54 years. Yeah. Uh, so it came about again as uh, something that I was involved in and uh, that I wanted to uh, use as a teaching um, source. And so that, I wrote it down. Yeah, you know, you, you, you're, um, um, and I'm realizing this more as we're talking, um, uh, it, it seems it, it's very organic, it seems. Um, uh, your approach to teaching, uh, using, um, using materials that you learned, you know, your experience in, in France and then creating a, a, a text to, to teach your students. Um, it seems very organic. Well, one of the things, um, it was all kind of, uh, adapting what I was doing there in the conservatory setting where all, that's all you did, you know, mm -hmm. you weren't going to dozens of other classes and anything else. It was just saxophone and practice, saxophone and practice. And uh, to, to set it up in such a way that it would be functional for my students. And, um, and so, yeah, and, and it's worked out and, I, you know, I, I get uh, emails and things from all over the world regarding it. And I actually, it, it, it also exists in a book I did for advanced music called uh, uh, saxophone intonation workbook and in that there's a whole thing on kind of basic embouchure and breathing and uh, and voicing and, and all of that and then a whole set of these scales and tuning exercises and a tuning uh, drone CD that goes along with it um, and so it's pretty much the same thing as the daily study or a portion of it is the same thing as the daily studies book or maybe more Clearly, I put the daily, daily studies book info in it. <laughs> <laughs> I see. As part of a, a method for dealing uh, and, and using that not only for technique but for intonation and sound and that kind of thing. Uh, okay, so I, uh, you taught me how to circular breathe. Yeah. And um, uh, how did you learn? <laughs> Well, I, I, I mentioned that I got bachelor uh, and my master's degree at the University of Arizona, and there was no saxophone teacher at the time. And I had a, a very good teacher who was the bassoonist. He also played saxophone, but just as a double for shows and stuff like that. His name was Wendell Jones, and um, he was a very, very fine musician. And one day I was playing the uh, Eugene Boat's uh, improvisation and caprice for me. And when I got to the caprice, uh, uh, I was in one section towards the bottom of the page, going to the top of the second page, and I was running out of air. And I could literally see it coming up, you know, feel it just coming up like this. Uh, everything was collapsing, but I was bound and determined to finish the phrase. And it's very hard to do if you don't have, you need a lot of air to, in support. But somehow I managed to take a breath and, and play the last measure or so of that. And I finished um, going through the piece and uh, uh, Dr. Jones looked at me and said, do you know what you did? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you took a circular breath. And then he showed it to me because he could do it. And, it, and it's much easier on bassoon or, or oboe uh, because of the resistance that it isn't necessarily on saxophone. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just kind of said, oh, 
You know, I'd never heard of that before. Cool. So I said, well, let me do it again. And I couldn't do it. So he had, you know, kind of showed me basically what it was and told and, and explained what I had accomplished. And then I, you know, sat in the practice room for weeks trying to do it again. And once I kind of figured out how to do it, then I wanted to use it in my teaching. And um, so I wrote the book um, also that was published by this little publishing company that then went on to one of the bigger companies and it's uh, disseminated around the world. And there've been several other books after that that have come out. One of the things that I never really uh, realized at the time in terms of doing it is that your tongue plays a big uh, part in pushing the air out. And I always, you know, talked about using your cheeks to do it uh, as a means of accomplishing it, but you can actually do it without even puffing your cheeks at all. If you very subtly use your tongue to push the air that's in your mouth forward as you take the breath. And it, it uh, that also helps in terms of not distorting the embouchure as much. And of course, when I saw James Moody do it on flute one night and play a whole chorus of, uh, of what's the bossa nova, I can't remember, double time, you know, tying and, and uh, circuit of breathing, then I, I realized there was a real master of it. Yeah, I, I, I've not managed to okay. learn how to do it on flute yet. It's, uh, it's, yeah, so, something in my head. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't compute yet. I went to the. Uh, I was. I remember very distinctly because that's the first time I met him, and uh, he was at the lighthouse in Hermosa Beach, and he was playing Wave, on flute, and uh, so after the set, you know, he came out and I talked to him for quite a while and. Um, Amazing, amazing man and player. So, at any rate, that uh, that's where that came from. Very interesting. Um, so, uh, I mean, if you had to, um, what were some of the more amazing moments in music? I mean, you you uh, of course you've mentioned some things, and maybe this is just will be redundant with some of what you've already said, but. Uh, as far as performances or just moments that were uh, big moments for you, maybe you felt like they culminating uh, kind of a moment. Um, wow. Well, um, also in the uh, early 70s, I was invited to go to Portland State University and perform the Preston Concerto with um, their wind ensemble. And so I was really excited because I had not played the piece before. And uh, so I learned it and uh, was informed that they were doing a festival of Paul Creston music. And Paul Creston taught at some small college in Washington State. And they had invited him down and he was going to be a guest of honor. So I uh, ended up playing the uh, concerto with the wind ensemble with him there in the rehearsal and he came up and you know talked about the music and said let's do this and do that and don't do this here i took the ending up an octave and he said no i said if i wanted it up there i'd have written it for soprano i'll just play it where it is and everybody plays plays the very ending of that piece and goes up to a high d or i actually went up to a double f sharp i think uh which is you know the final note and um, and he said, no, I don't want that. I don't want that. And then he said, uh, do you know my sonata? And of course, every classical saxophone player from high school years on, you know, has played the Creston sonata. And he said, well, uh, shall we do it as an encore? And I said, OK, I hadn't, you know, been practicing it or, or working on it specifically, but I played it and I recorded it. And um, so he, he pulled out of his briefcase the piano part, put the solo part on a stand, walked over to the piano. And while we've got a, a whole uh, uh, wind ensemble sitting here, we played the sonata straight through. And he said, great, let's do it on the concert. OK. And uh, then he went over to my piano part. And uh, pianists love that piece because there are all these tents in the left hand. And it's a, a very athletic piano part. And uh, 
uh, Preston was a very short, kind of portly man with very short fingers, very small hands. And, uh, you know, he, he took a uh, piano part and he went through and he said, they don't need to play this. They don't need to play this. And he started scratching all these things off. He said, I was young when I wrote this. So, you know, this isn't really necessary. And so he was editing my piano part to make it a little bit easier for mm -hmm. pianists to play. So uh, that's something that, um, you know, was kind of a highlight and fun because he's a, an important composer, uh, especially back in the 60s, 70s, when our repertoire was still classical repertoire was still growing and, you know, looking for more American music for the saxophone. Um, there was a, a lot of performances with the Western Jazz Quartet. Uh, we did uh, six weeks in Thailand and we were playing outdoor concerts uh, on beaches, on big kind of rock, you know, stages with lights and sound and all that kind of stuff. And there was one time when we were, uh, got up to play and the moon was rising off mm -hmm. of the ocean. And it was the most stunning thing I've ever saw, seen. And I, you know, it was almost hard to play and just keep looking at that as it was happening. Um, had uh, one performance in Brasilia, Brazil, that uh, it was just something about it that was magical. You know, it, it was a little cool. We were playing a little outdoor theater-like and it wasn't a big crowd i mean it was full but it wasn't a big place and um you know it was just one of those nights when everything in for the band and for me and the music and everything just seemed to be like just step back and watch you know as opposed to uh, being an actual part of what you were doing uh, a few things like that i uh, had some amazing tours uh in uh, poland with randy brecker um, and um, the people, just meeting those people uh, that were f just freshly out of, uh, off of, or out of the Soviet Union control, uh, and the food, and, you know, there's just so many wonderful things that, uh, you know, that kind of stand out in my mind about a lot of uh, gigs and performances and things like that. It tends to be, to be more of the situation than it does necessarily just the, you know, the amazing opportunity of a performance at some prestigious venue or, you know, place. Uh, had a great time playing with Randy and the Western Jazz Quartet in an IAGE conference in Chicago, and we played mostly Randy's music. Um, and uh, that was stressful for me because, you know, uh, I'm always suspicious of my jazz playing. Um, and, uh, you know, to have so many people name people in the jazz world come up and, and you know, kind of uh, congratulate you afterwards. That was kind of a special time for me, too. Again, I consider myself the teacher more than the player. You know, uh, uh, a highlight, a big moment in my life um, was uh, not that long ago when I was playing with the Count Basie Orchestra and you, your wife, drove what is it two hours uh, yeah about probably yeah uh to come and uh, uh come to the concert of course i got you tickets and you came backstage yeah. uh for a bit um that was a that was a big moment for me um after all the years all you know all the years that had been had transpired since i had seen you um um and since you had heard me play <laughs> Uh, well, graduated yeah. in ninety what? Masters was ninety. Uh, Masters was two thousand one. Two thousand one. And, right? and the undergrad was ninety nine. Ninety nine. Yeah, yeah. So I remember I had a sabbatical leave right in there, maybe ninety nine, ninety eight, ninety nine. It was the third. It was the third year I was there. It was ninety. Wow. Let's, let's see here. So I started there in ninety five. So it would have been uh, 97, 98 or something when your sabbatical was, yeah. yeah. That was a year I had lots of guest artist teachers come in. Like That's Chris right, Potter. Chris Potter and... and uh, Seamus. Yeah, Seamus Blake and uh, Walt... Uh, Walt Weisskopf. Yep. Yeah, 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 that was... Uh, that was really... That was really cool. Um, I would have rather you were there for that year <laughs> but it was really great 
uh, learning from those those uh, those others. But you know, then again, we had uh, you know I I did my master's degree there also, and we and I had the time with you too. I learned so much from you, and I appreciate um, you know I appreciate uh, like I said your your willingness to uh, be so generous and to use your own experiences and not to sort of keep that for you but to be willing to share it with your students that's a and and this probably just seems like a normal thing and a regular thing for you but i assure you that there are a lot of teachers that that's not the way that they do it um well you know one of my favorite things uh, in teaching was and something that i strove strove to do is um i tried to find the uniqueness of every student I had and tried to build on that. Um, so, you know, it, just in terms of developing a sound, you know, nobody's got the same breathing apparatus. Nobody has the same speaking voice. Nobody has the same larynx, the same tongue, the same lip formation, jaw formation, um, and, or the same ears. And so what I would try to do is develop the individuality of every student and refine that to the extent that it was possible, you know, and, and probably 98% of the time it was. And, um, and then of course I had my own dogma of you know, etudes and solos and transcriptions and all these things that I thought uh, were important, but I would choose them based on what I thought the student needed to get to the next step whether it was, you know, whether it was an articulation issue or it was a sound issue or an intonation issue or a phrasing issue or, a, um, you know, whatever the musical setting might be, classical or jazz. And um, I found it more fun that way rather than thinking that, well, everybody has to sound like me or play like me or, um, you know, regurgitate, create, create clones that you know that leave and of course nobody's going to be a clone of anybody else but but you know if you're if you're if i'm picking a mouthpiece for you because it's my mouthpiece then that's not necessarily going to work for you what we need to find is the mouthpiece that fits you the best in order to get the best out of you for this particular situation jazz situation classical situation and um, that challenge i found really a lot of fun um, as a as a teacher and as a player, um, as a composer and arranger, um, what uh, what artists have been particularly influential? Um, you know, I'm such a chameleon in terms of what I like that certainly there. Um, you know, Cannonball Adderley was a really strong influence on the early then Phil Woods. Um, and um, Paul Desmond was also, uh, because when I was in college, so, you know, the Take Five and Blue Ronda, Ronda All the Turk and that, you know, that music, uh, Odd Time Signatures was all the rage. And I was really loved it and was into it. Um, and I just tried to you know, to listen to everything and steal from everybody <laughs> uh, and, and try to make it my own. But, you know, um, uh, Michael Brecker is such an amazing human being and a player. Uh, he was a huge influence. And of course, at that same time, all the students wanted to play like him. Um, and so uh, as a, as a writer, a composer, you know, I don't, it's really hard for me to try to think of somebody because I didn't study anybody. I just listened and then tried to, you know, figure out what that was and what this was and use it and, and try to come up with something that, uh, that I liked and hopefully somebody else would like. Uh, but every major saxophone player, you know, every major composer, arranger in jazz, uh, uh, you know, from Thad Jones to Bob Brookmeyer to Rob McConnell to, you know, Gordon Goodwin, you know, Fletcher Henderson, um, all, all of these people, uh, all, all of these amazing artists, um, you know, I uh, just enjoy their music so much and, and uh, I try to absorb it and then see what comes out. 
you know, there was one, uh, at, uh, there was another moment um, that was a real highlight for me too. Um, when we were, when I was still a, a student, I, I, I think I was an undergrad. I'm sure I was an undergrad. And I was still playing lead alto, and uh, in the big band that you directed, the top band, um, and I. We were rehearsing uh, uh, some music, and it had a big alto solo in it. Um, and I can't think of the name of the tune, but um, I played a solo, and you leaned, you leaned down, and you said that was a great solo. And uh, it was. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you, you were always very generous with compliments and everything, but there was, there was a little bit more, a little, a little edge on that when you said it. And it, uh, really, uh, I mean, I, obviously I still remember it now. It was a, it was a big moment then. <laughs> It'll always be a big moment. <laughs> I'm, you know, at, at, at uh, this stage in my life, my career, you know, is pretty much over. I haven't been able to play saxophone in over four years now, or haven't. I can still play, but I've had some hand issues and operations, and um, so I can't really play at the level that uh, I, I would uh, expect. And so I just haven't played. Um, but I, I, I'm, I wish that I would have been done more of that or been more that way in terms of what you just mentioned you know mm -hmm. uh, it's not that I didn't compliment students on playing well or doing great things but my mind is always okay what's next and so I'm um, and, and my my brain works that way too I don't mem remember lots of things mm -hmm. uh, you know certain key things that are pivotal in life you remember but um, they I don't recall them where my wife can remember every detail about everything. And it's not that, you know, I'm getting senile or uh, some kind of dementia in my old age. It's just that my whole train of thought is now and what's next. And I'm not thinking or even remembering or paying attention to what, uh, you know, what went on yesterday or last week or last year. And, and as a result, I tended to be, uh, a little more kind of, you know, straight ahead, let's move on kind of um, in my dealings with students and in, in just in my life, basically. Um, and so that's something that I wish, you know, if I had it to do over again, I would slow down a little bit and not be, you know, not have my mind going so fast about you know, what's coming up uh, to be in the moment a little bit more. Uh, you know, I uh, that kind of ties in with um, uh, with one of my next questions, which is just about what goals do you have? What what, what are you trying to? Um, what is it that you uh, uh, want to accomplish? What what are you focused on these days? What do you feel like maybe is unfinished that you're, you know, still you know, still kind of focused on, still thinking about, especially since you just said you're you're always thinking, you know, out ahead. Well, um, I retired in 2012. Yeah. When I retired, before I retired, for, you know, four or five years when I saw it coming. And it's coming down the road, what are you going to be doing? And I thought, and I had all these plans about, you know, I, I knew I was going to retire and move back to Arizona. I didn't want to be in the Midwest in the winters anymore. And it, um, the, the uh, winters were very hard on my wife. Um, so we almost immediately after retiring, literally, uh, I left a, a few days after the last class of juries were over with and, and went to South Africa and Mozambique on a two week tour with the Western Jazz Quartet. Mm -hmm. And I finished that tour it was like a 27 hour flight home 17 hours from from johannesburg to uh atlanta uh, hartfield and then another flight you know detroit another flight to kalamazoo 
I got home and I was just totally burned out. Two days later, my whole house was packed in a moving van and we were gone. And at that point, I was kind of so burnt out, uh, just, you know, 45 years of teaching, 39 of them there. Um, and I came to Arizona. I didn't have any performance outlets. I just wanted to get away from everything as far as I could. I had no desire to to uh, be creative or play or anything like that. And I got moved into the new house and everything was set. And, and I'm starting to feel guilty. You know, maybe I should be writing something. Uh, and then I said, well, for what? For whom? Who's going to play it? Um, well, maybe I should be practicing. Well, <laughs> man, who's, you know, and then um, days and weeks and months went on. And finally, a, a, a guy called me from Phoenix and said, uh, hey, I hear you're in Arizona. You want to play? And I said, oh, OK. <laughs> and so I joined the uh, Superstition Jazz Orchestra in Phoenix and uh, played with them for three years um, on the jazz tenor chair. Um, Mike Crotty was the lead alto player and wrote most of the music. A lot of the guys were former airmen of note uh, player, uh, you know, retirees. Uh, and so the band was really good, it was really strong. And so that was fun. And then um, I moved from the Phoenix area back to Tucson and my hands were really starting to get, I have a condition called contracture. And I have it on both linger and it's where they curl in in here kind of uh, gets tight and you can't move it. No way I could play anything on the left hand little finger. And same thing with the right hand little finger. Since I've had surgeries on both of them, but they're still not back to normal and they still don't have total stability. So, you know, when I was saying that, so that moved me further away from it. And um, for a while, I really felt guilty about it. But I finally just assumed uh, or just accepted the fact that, you know, that was my career. I did it. I, I gave it my all. Uh, I enjoyed it. I love my students, but that's done. And now I don't, I've turned down offers to educate and do things like that because I'm just um, not in kind of a situation now I feel it's necessary and that uh, younger people and opportunities and experience and so I'm going to step aside and let that happen and I've always played golf I remember senior year that, yeah that was going to be that was going to be my next uh, my next so, question uh, yep my senior year in college I went to student teach and my first day of student teaching, I walked into the band room. The band director there came up to me and said, okay, Trent, at 7.30, we have freshman band. At 8.30, we have this. At 9.30, at 11.30, we have lunch. At 12.30, we have the symphonic band. At 1.30, we play golf. And I said, I don't play golf. And he said, you do now. <laughs> and so... <laughs> The next day or two, I went out and bought a set of golf clubs, and I was awful. It was awful. It was a still experience. Almost all of the band directors in the city, and there were dozens played. It was a group. It was fun. And, uh, and so that started me. And I played off and on uh, when I was uh, teaching in, in the Midwest. And, of course, you don't play in the winters there. But later on, they got the dome where you could go hit golf balls in the winter. And uh, my grandson was also uh, got into it. And so I was working with him and he was a high school star. And, and um, it was always my way of getting away from music, stopping, you know, get your mind off of it, get it on something. Kind of, you probably you're the gym. And it's, a, it's a similar kind of thing. And so I've really got now. right now I'm the best of my life. I'm down to a four or five handicap. Uh, the other day, I even par around, um, if, uh, and I put some regularity, you know, shooting the low to mid 70s, pretty rare. And um, uh, it's it's a challenge, and it's something I'm doing. And uh, here, you can do it year round, <laughs> and even 
with the situation we're going through this awful virus thing, um, you know, I can go out there with one or two or three other people and never be defeat from them and enjoy two or three hours of great exercise. I walk and um, it's, um, it's been a psychological and physical savior for me in a way. You know, is there is there anything else that you uh, that you want to that you'd like to say, or um, uh, or anything else that uh, you'd like me to mention? Well, not that I can think of. Um, yeah, it's, it was just you know so many great students in uh, in my career there, and a lot of them went on to be high school band. You know, are now starting <laughs> uh, from the early years, and I've had a lot of students that have gone to teach college, like you know, and have gone on to play professionally. And uh, it's you know, it's just a highlight of my uh, to see all the accomplishments and remember seeing in one. I'm not getting married. I'm going to be a player. I'm just going to do this. You know, and now they've got grandkids. <laughs> so, uh, so to, to, to watch uh, to watch them all grow and mature and everything, and amazing that you've accomplished and that you've done, you know, is um, is such a treat for me to uh, just stand back and um, there's nothing else that I can think of unless you've got more questions. <laughs> no, I don't. And um, I uh, again, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, uh, like I said, I've learned so much from you, and um, you know, and the more I teach, uh, the more certain memories come back of of your teaching and your approach to certain things, and things dawn on me. Oh, that's why, <laughs> that's why he was doing this this way, you know. Um, and especially when I encounter certain kinds of students, um, wow. you know, and just uh, so. I just want to say thank you for all that you've done. Um, you've had so many tremendous students. I was just one of many very talented students that you uh, that you had, and uh, you've contributed so much and you've done so much for all of us. So I just I want to say thank you. Well, you're welcome, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you again. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. God bless you, and uh, stay safe. And same to you and your family. All right, all right. now. Bye.